20 seconds from release. Ten, five, three, two, one, release, release, release. Ignition. Good control. Trimming, that's turning, pulling the nose up. And trim is set. We're now traveling at approximately Mach 1.4. There's max Q, that's the maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Those on board are experiencing about three G's at the moment. The trim is complete and Unity is in the vertical headed toward space. Mach 2. Mach 2.8, rocket motor cutoff. Amazing. All right. Predicted apogee today is 275,000 feet. That's 84.3 kilometers. Incredible. Our mission specialists have been cleared to unstrap and enjoy the zero-G experience. This is amazing. This, what you're seeing is uh, Colonel Villa Day going to the back to tend to the payloads that are mounted on the rack. You can see Landolfi and Leo starting their experiments in their seat and having, it looks like, a great time, <laughs> of course. Yep. The feather is moving, as you can see. Starting that backflip maneuver I spoke of, the feather is now fully up. Amazing. And viva la Italia! This is 100 years for the Italian Air Force. So happy centennial to the Air Force. This is absolutely incredible. And welcome to space astronauts. How absolutely incredible. Ben, ben, benvenito nello espacio. Congratulations to Walter, Angelo, and Leo on becoming astronauts today. And a special congratulations to our pilot, Nicola, for his first space flight. Welcome back to space. Mike and Colin, this is absolutely incredible. Wonderful. You can see I'm tripping over my words because I can see <laughs> all the excitement here. And we've also trained our astronauts as part of our training program to, at Apogee, go to the window and take a look outside. So you're seeing them take a look and really t reflect and take in the view because all of the science and all of the research that they're conducting on board is for that vehicle, for that, that planet that they're looking out on. Mm -hmm. It's really that science and research being invested back into this planet. And it's important for them to reflect and see where their hard work is going. Right. We have uh, achieved apogee at 85.1 kilometers or 279,000 feet. Incredible. The pilots are currently doing the, completing the backfill maneuver, uh, orienting the vehicle for reentry. Now, just before 0.1 Gs, the pilots will give that return to, uh, uh, return to seats call to the mission specialists. And our training team has worked this portion of the flight out so that it's very natural and intuitive for our passengers. You know, when we talk about space travel, a lot of people know and they expect the boost portion of flight to be loud and thrilling. And of course it is. But what's interesting is that the reentry is actually very similar. So as supersonic air flowing over our vehicle in the feathered configuration, shock waves form on top of the cabin, and those are audible to those inside. And for those of you on site here at Spaceport America watching from the ground, you should hear a double sonic boom as Spaceship Unity once again breaks the sound barrier. We're currently at Mach 2.5. Incredible. And just back to 1G as we begin reentry. And those views are just absolutely Amazing. Yes. So for reentry, we're now at um, about 3.6 Gs uh, for those on board. The crew will um, 
orient the attitude of the spaceship so that when we come out of reentry and feather down, we'll be uh, pointed toward spaceport. We're now subsonic. And, and at 75,000 feet. And the unique uh, part of our design is as a, as a vehicle that can get into this con feathered configuration, we're a glider, we're, we're a rocket, we're a glider, and we're a capsule at the right phases of flight that help our unique design be, be safe and effective for the mission it's at. That's right. We're at 61,000 feet now, continuing to descend in the feathered configuration. When we get down to about 53,000 feet, the pilots will lower, command lower of the feather again and turn, reconfigure the vehicle back into a glider. The views are just so incredibly amazing all the way down and it's just part of each phase of flight has its unique experience. Mm -hmm. It has the ability to also conduct science. Our payloads that are on the rack are conducting and recording data all the way through each phase of flight. So you get hypergravity and, and low gravity data and that transition in between. The feather is almost completed the feather down. It is now down and locked. Those watching from Spaceport America, now's a great time to go outside. Unity will be coming into view and you can cheer on the crew as they return to Earth. Now, the mission specialists on the flight are supported by an incredible team on the ground from both the Air Force and the Center for National Research in Italy, who designed and developed the research being conducted on board. Space-based research is an incredible capability that is being opened up by suborbital vehicles like our own space flight system. One of, the re one of the researchers utilizing this capability to the fullest is here with us in the studio. I'm so excited. A future astronaut, a friend, and a space-based researcher, Kelly Girardi. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, I gotta ask, how are you feeling having watched this incredible crew go to space today knowing that you're gonna be there on a future space flight? It's surreal, I have to say. <laughs> Just the energy outside, and I've had the benefit from being on this side of the live stream for a number of Virgin Galactic space flights, including yours. And it's so special to experience that here at Spaceport America with the crew and their families and the Virgin Galactic workforce and mission control. And it's emotional. I, I remember during your space flight when I heard release, 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 I burst into tears and I'm glad that my mic was off during the live cast, but it's the profundity of human space flight. And I'm so ready to be on the other side of this live stream. It's incredible. I mean, this is my sixth space flight and you probably saw I was tripping over my words. I just couldn't get it out because of the excitement. Exactly. And so you're on a future dedicated research mission. Could you tell us a little bit about the science that you're going to be conducting? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm flying on a dedicated research mission. I am representing my research institute, the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences, and I'm going to be doing healthcare and fluid research in space. I'll be wearing a wearable sensor system to take biometric monitoring. It's called the AstroSkin. It's currently worn by astronauts on the International Space Station, but my flight will be the first time we're collecting data during the launch, re-entry, and landing phases of flight as well. And then fluid research to help design. I'm going to be looking at how fluid behaves in a container in microgravity during flight, and that can help inform new designs for life support systems or syringe design for administering medication in space, things like that. So I'm very excited. That's, I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I cannot wait. So what role do you see suborbital vehicles like VSS Unity playing in, the, in future research? Yeah, it's critical. I mean, this is a new era of access to space, and there is a tidal wave of scientific research that can benefit from this platform. You know, we've done a lot of work, a decade of work here on Earth, iterating with payloads, payload operations, technology iteration, international collaboration, parabolic flight campaigns, where the aircraft takes that roller coaster profile here on Earth, where you get short bursts of microgravity. That's amazing for quickly iterating on technology, but to really validate it, you, you need high quality microgravity and you need longer duration exposure to microgravity. You need to be in space. And so I'm really looking forward to the availability of Virgin Galactic as a platform, not just for the scientific community, but for academia, for students, for so many. So I'm so excited to get to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So I know you didn't plant, you did not plant this question. Everyone watching should not plant this question, but Kelly, I loved your book, not necessarily rocket science. <laughs> I did not plant that question. <laughs> but part of the appeal of suborbital vehicles is it really opening up the aperture of who can do science and technology. Yeah. And this is just another science lab for people to utilize to further whatever field of research that they're in. Can you talk about some of the other research fields that are utilizing these kinds of capabilities, maybe even at IAAS? Yeah, absolutely. It's really multidisciplinary. It's not just space science. Uh, my colleagues come from such a wide variety of backgrounds and fields of research. I've been particularly motivated by some of my colleagues who are doing research related in space related to the quality of human life here on Earth, human health and well-being, whether that's biomedical or pharmaceutical research or even new ways to approach telemedicine or you know technical instruction for remote or extreme environments. I just think those are use cases that are so compelling and interesting to me to really use space to benefit life here on Earth. It's absolutely amazing. And I love how you speak about this industry because you've been an advocate and a part of this industry for a while. And can you talk about what drew you to the commercial space side? Yeah, absolutely. I have long been an evangelist for the commercial space flight industry, and I've really been inspired by it. I have a deeply rooted belief in the potential of this industry to open up access to space, to truly democratize access to space, certainly for science communities and for the research community like myself and the crew of Galactic 01, but I also for civilians of all disciplines. I really do believe that the space age is a broader cultural movement and that our next giant leap will require the talents of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. Space is our shared past and our shared future, and that's why I wrote not necessarily rocket science. <laughs> Okay, well, we're gonna be getting to landing soon, but I wanted to ask if you had any parting thoughts before I release you to go cheer on the crew yeah. as they return to Earth. Yeah, just awe, excitement, I'm sure you can tell. I'm just, you know, it's amazing to be here. And just deep appreciation for all that goes into this and all that this means. I know this is the beginning of routine and regular commercial operations, but to me, it will never get old. Oh my God, thank you so much for <laughs> thank joining you. us here Thank you, I'm gonna today. run down and welcome that crew back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Thanks. Kelly. All right, that, this is just an absolutely exciting time for the research community. I mean, the excitement yes, off of Kelly is just absolutely. palpable, and I can't wait for us to be cheering her on as she does her research in science and space soon. So let's check in with our crew on their descent back to Earth. Absolutely. So we are just over 11,000 feet. Uh, for those of you here on site, Unity just crossed over the field and is making another uh, uh, circle around in the pattern. Uh, beginning those landing approach, um, uh, passing the waypoints that we've designated as part of our energy management plan. So <clears throat> the pilots have uh, joined up with Chase in the pattern and they're discussing that energy management plan. They're gonna be landing today on runway 34. That means from south to north. Uh, and for those non-pilots tuning in, those numbers represent the first two numbers on the mag magnetic heading of the compass for the runway direction. So for example, 3-4 three, is 340 degrees. The landing gear is now down and locked. We have three green, that means all gear are down and locked. And we're making our final approach to the runway here at Spaceport America. We like to make left-hand turns for our approach. That's because the commander is in the left seat and that provides the best line of sight for them as they come in to the landing. Now the runway here at Spaceport America is 12,000 feet long. That's 3.7 kilometers and 200 feet wide or 61 meters. One thousand feet above the runway. 500 feet. 500 Over the threshold, that's the beginning of the runway. And you'll see the pilots hold the nose up. That's a uh, flare maneuver, all part of the energy management. Main gear touchdown. So the pilots will continue to hold the nose gear in the air as we continue to bleed off some energy as we run down the runway. And at the designated airspeed, they will lower the nose gear as well. Nose gears down. 
Now, as our ground speed slows, when we reach a designated ground speed, the pilots will apply the brakes and bring the vehicle to a complete stop. All right, braking now. And there's wheel stop. 